I'm Paul Jones, work for Volker Rail, and I'd just like to take issue one thing Stephen did say in, in his opening, that um, having worked on, in both sectors, heavy rail and urban rail, as a relative statement, I do think urban rail is the sexiest um, part of railways. Uh, and I think, welcome to Manchester. I think for an urban rail conference hosted in Manchester, I think it's appropriate that we start with the largest urban rail uh, expansion project uh, nationally, which is the Manchester Metrolink project. We've been running it for, or expanding it for the last 10 years. We're still live on site. We have another two years to go until we complete. And TFGM have expansion plans that take the Metrolink beyond where it is at the moment through and beyond 2020. So who are we? Well, it's quite a convoluted relationship. Um, the delivery organisation is MPT. Uh, and we, ma we managed to make it even more complicated by MPT as a consortium made up of a joint venture and TALIS. So the joint venture is MPACT, and MPACT is a joint venture between Volker Rail and Langer Rail. And we look after all the civil engineering, the railways, the structural elements and the buildings, and TALIS do the, the power and the rail systems. Don't ask me where the joint venture title of MPAC comes from, because even though I was there at the start of it in 2004, nobody seems to know why we came up with the name MPAC. <coughs> For the project itself, we've been on site since 2008. We're in our 10th year. We have introduced seven new lines across the network, in the north, in the east, in the south. Um, that in, that's a total of 66 new kilometres. When we first started, the tram system was 30-something kilometres. It's now approaching 100 kilometres. We've built and commissioned 64 new stops and done work on several of the existing stops on the existing network. So the, the red, or the yellow, was the network as it was when we came in 2008. The solid red is the network as it exists today. And the dotted red is the expansion that is ongoing at the moment, taking the route from uh, Pomona and Cornbrook out to the Trafford Centre. And in amongst all that, we also built a operations and maintenance <coughs> depot at the junction between the Altrincham Line and the South Manchester Line. So I was asked to give you a very brief run through of the 10 years of a major uh, construction project in 10 minutes. So you'll have to bear with me because it's a bit of a canter. Um, so the lines themselves, so back in 2008, we took over the heavy rail line that runs from North Manchester out to Rochdale. It's 22 kilometres of heavy rail route uh, running through um, a fairly rural area of North Manchester, terminating at Rochdale. Quite a significant challenge in terms of interfacing with the existing structures, um, widening the alignment, changing the gradients of the existing <coughs> route to accommodate the new tram system. The majority of the route is ballasted track, so it's fairly traditional railway construction techniques. Um, it also included taking a loop off the main line, so the heavy rail line actually ran on viaduct uh, to the south of Oldham. We actually put a two and a half kilometre uh, urban section through Oldham Town Centre itself. So some fairly unique challenges actually taking a tram seat, a tram system through um, a very uh, densely populated and uh, business populated town centre such as Oldham. Then moving to the south in 2008, we picked up the line from the Altrincham line at Trafford Bar and installed three kilometres of route down to Chalton, which is, the, this is the Altrincham line and this is fairly straight traditional ballasted track section that runs down to Chalton. Interesting for the South Manchester line, it was an old mothball railway line. Um, it's been out of use for some 30 or 30 or 40 years, so it's become its own natural wildlife habitat. So there's quite a significant amount of work to do to bring that section up to a standard where you can actually start to construct. So quite a lot of ecological and environmental impact issues that we had to consider. Uh, Dewatering, this was classed as a habitat lagoon. Um, that's not what the locals see it as, it's a trolley park, a uh, Morrison shopping bag holding centre. Um, but certainly lots of um, apparently edible dormice are protected and as are newts and bats and badgers and everything else that we seem to live just in this 200 metre section of the route. Um, so over the two years we transferred, uh, we changed that to the stop at Chalton um, and 
the, the majority of the three kilometres of the route had to go through a similar sort of transformation. This was then extended out to East Didsbury, a further seven kilometres from 2010 to 2013. Similar challenges, um, rural in nature, albeit there are housing estates on either side of these tree lines. Um, the swept path needed to be widened from the heavy rail environment to accommodate the full system that is a tram scheme, but to keep the, the route as tight to the swept path as possible, we had to install sheet piles along the majority of the route on both sides to constrain the width. Um, that obviously gave us significant challenges in dealing with the local residents um, who weren't particularly impressed with us doing percussion hammering of sheet piles for about a year and a half outside the back gardens of their properties. But through local engagement between uh, MPT and TFGM and local uh, engagement with the residents on a monthly basis, we were able to deal with their concerns and discuss the programme of works and actually manage it through. So the relationship with the local, uh, local residents was maintained and positive throughout. As I said earlier, we also built a maintenance and uh, operations depot uh, in the South of Manchester, so altering the line, South Manchester line. Um, so in the triangle here, a large depot. So this moved all the operations and stabling points for the trams from the Queen's Road depot in the north of the city to the south of the city, which accommodated the increased fleet that was required and the change in fleet that was required over the last 10 years. We also expanded out to the east, so we interfaced at Piccadilly, so in the Undercroft at Piccadilly Station, and then ran through a fairly urban area past Manchester City's football ground, which at the time was the, the Commonwealth Stadium, and out to Droylston. Again, different challenges to what we've seen on the previous lines. Whilst this wasn't a natural uh, wildlife habitat, it was extremely congested. It's one of the main arterial routes in and out of the city centre, and we were required to maintain traffic flows all the time and build a tram system right in the middle of the highway. That is a significant challenge. We came up with several construction techniques which were fairly new to tram construction at the time, so slip forming um, techniques to make the installation of the concrete track slab quicker some more traditional techniques of in situ reinforced concrete construction. But it certainly wasn't without its challenges trying to build a tram scheme at the same time as maintaining the traffic flows in and out of the city centre. That was then extended from Droylston out to Ashton between 2010 and 2013, another four kilometres of on street. Um, less of an interface with the existing traffic. We were going through the central reserve and down the verges but still lots of unique challenges associated with building um, a, a complex system in that environment. 2010, we also started the build of the airport line connection. This takes a connection from the South Manchester line at Chalton, winds its way through 15 kilometres through uh, Sale Water Park area, down through Withenshaw Town Centre, and then interfacing directly with the airport, and we actually built a new airport stop in the existing network rail stop location in the airport. So that's a very intermodal connection. So there's um, the bus interchange, the heavy rail interchange, and the tram interchange. So a perfect example of trains, planes, trams, automobiles, and everything in that one location. The airport line offered challenges that we were seeing in all the other lines, but all wrapped up into one 15 kilometre section, just to make it nice and easy for us to um, see all the challenges ahead of us. So at Sale Water Park, it's a site of biological interest. We were required to put a 600 metre viaduct right through the middle of that uh, area, and it terminated with a bridge over the River Mersey. Not quite the same as the one Keir have just built over the River Mersey, Some quite a lot smaller. Um, Lots of structures on the airport line. Two of the most significant ones were over the M56 and M60 motorway. We weren't allowed to put a pier in the central reserve of the motorway, so we ended up with a 55 metre single span um, girder bridge, the abutments of which built off line, and then the actual 600 tonne decks themselves moved into place on a Saturday night and installed in 12 hours using SPMTs. Um, anybody that's as much of a geek as I am. I have got videos of the installations of all those bridges, so come and see me afterwards. We can sit in, in a huddle and, and watch them. 
Airport line, as with the other schemes, very urban area. So this is Kerscott Housing Estate area. So there is one patch of green in amongst all that. There is now a little bit of green and a lot of tram. One of the challenges with a tram, as, uh, which is different to a, a heavy rail system, is the curvature of the rail that you need to actually wind your way through an urban environment. So here we have track radiuses coming down to somewhere in the order of 30 metres, which for heavy rail people would make their hair stand on end. For a tram scheme, it makes your hair stand on end as well, to be honest. Um, that then interfaces with the, a, the, the a5, a, A56, the Altrincham Road, which is one of the busiest routes in and out of Manchester from uh, Altrincham Sale into uh, the M56 and Manchester City Centre. So the busiest junction, one of the busiest junctions in the whole of Greater Manchester, and we're putting a tram scheme right through the middle of it and keeping it live and fully operational at all times. Again, anybody that wants to see the 250 staging diagrams for that as well, that's on the same computer as the presentations for the bridges. Again, lots of what you could class as deforesting. There's, we managed to pick all the areas which has all the trees in Manchester to put the tram, th tram through, but our sustainability charter, we actually replaced each tree that we removed with five trees elsewhere in Manchester. More recently, we have improved the resilience of the ski, the system, by introducing a second line through the city centre. So one of the, one of the issues that the operators and the maintainers of the system had up to 2017, significant increase in the volume of routes to the north of the centre, significant volume increases to the south, but only one route through the city centre. And bear in mind, all the trams come back and stable south of the city of an evening, there's a significant requirement to maintain a route through the city centre. So any issues on Market Street or on Mosley Street effectively prohibits the movement of trams in and out of the city centre or through the city centre. So two parts to the Deansgate Castlefields and Second City Crossing scheme, which is quite obviously Deansgate Castlefields and Second City Crossing. So at Deansgate Castlefields, we built an iconic stop. So these were the artist's impressions of the stop, which we presented to uh, Greater Manchester in advance of the works. Um, oops. A, living, a planned living wall, grass track. Anybody that's tried to build and maintain grass track knows the unique nature of trying to keep grass track alive. Um, and the plan was to use actual grass as opposed to uh, astroturf type material which is used elsewhere. Um, the access steps up to the station and then the walking route or the bridge through from Deansgate Heavy Rail Stop to Deansgate Castle Tram Stop, all very architecturally uh, designed. And then the actual, I think you'll agree, um, the, the brightness is probably a bit too low to show it, but they are. It's a very, very close resemblance to the artist's impression. Anybody that's actually used the tram and goes up, down Whitworth Street and sees um, the Deansgate Castle stop probably agree that it is, is, is very uh, iconic. All the challenges associated with sticking a tram through the centre of uh, one of the busiest city centres in, in England. Anybody that's driven through Manchester without the tram scheme uh, underway will appreciate how difficult it is to drive around. We start closing down junctions and roads and still maintaining 100% traffic flows. Again, lots of challenges. Short sections of road open and available to us. Junctions done in, in halves or in quarters. So it takes a long time to put a tram scheme through a city centre and some very unique challenges associated with connections of the OLE system to the existing businesses. Lots of underground cellars which come underneath the highway that we have to either infill or to work around and obviously lots of businesses who are reliant on the footfall of pedestrians that we need to maintain the flows of in and around the works. So that's the system that was all completed and commissioned and operational as of the end of last year. Since then what have we been doing? Well we've now started the extension from Pomona Viaduct, winding its way through Trafford Park past Event City terminating at Trafford Centre. So we've extended in a blockade in August this year the Pomona Viaduct and we are well underway with the tram installation, track installation through to Trafford Centre to another five and a half kilometres of route, another six stops and at the moment that is on target to open at its service completion, a service start date of October 2020. Touched on the bridges previously, Smedley Viaduct just north of Manchester on the Old and Rochdale line 
They did significant structural repairs, as did a number of the there's 25 existing bridges on the Oldham Rochdale line, all of which needed some form of structural intervention. New viaducts required where we're actually crossing the network rail line. And as I mentioned before, 600 tonne single span box through girder bridges over the M56 and M60. There the SPMT is installed in 12 hours on a very rainy Saturday night. So innovation, one of the advantages of working on a scheme for, for 10 years where you do a section followed by another section is it's unique in able to being able to implement your lessons learned. So as a civil engineer, we often complete a project, hold a lessons learned event, put them on the shelf, and then you can take the, 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 the process improvements. But in terms of actually taking a direct like for like benefit from it, it's very difficult because very, very rarely do we go and build exactly the same thing again. We've done exactly the same thing here seven times. So we've been able to look at what we're doing and refine it time and time again to ensure that we're streamlining the, the most significant processes. One of the ones we're most uh, proud of is the work on the Joint Utilities Group. So very early stages, we, uh, we appreciated that the utility diversion work, which is being completed in advance of the, the, the civil's construction managed by TFGM, um, has quite a significant opportunity to delay the project and anybody that's worked with local authorities and uh, utility companies and their um, contractors knows the unique risk, the unique challenge of trying to manage 12 independent <coughs> utility organizations we had approximately 2,000 diversions to manage this would not have been possible without the development of a integrated team this was this was TFGM or GMPT as they were at the time TFGM MPT and representatives of each of the utilities organizations we had a charter that said how we were going to work together. This allowed us to go into each of the organizations, look at their processes, so all the way through the C process, outline design, detail design, procurement, material procurement, mobilization on site, traffic management, streamline those processes as we can through being a major civil engineering contractor, offering advice, being able to shorten the time it takes from design through to starting work on site integrating the program to ensure that we have the right utility going in, working at the right time. And we were able to mitigate, when we first started the project, we were forecasting somewhere upwards of a four year impact from the 2000 service diversions. Through this process, we were able to mitigate all of that and actually ended up delivering the airport line, especially 12 months early. Typically, that's what we'd find when we broke ground. Obviously, one of the issues with Manchester being a, an old, historic, industrial city is there's lots of new, old, abandoned services in the ground. The utility records aren't perhaps as up-to-date as they should be or could be. So some of this is abandoned, some of this is live, some of it nobody knows who owns it. And it, it, it took a considerable effort from the Joint Utilities team to actually divert all these, abandon and remove all of this. All of these services were eventually removed from the swept path of the route. So we go from that's how we find it to that's how we leave it. So we are now having learnt lessons. We as MPT, as a major national civil engineering organisation, we are now doing all the service diversions. So we do all, we do a central dig. So this is off the Trafford Park line. It's five and a half kilometres, four kilometres of it. We have uh, combined utility trenching where we do the civil engineering, we do the traffic management, the utility companies come along and either put their ducts or cables or pipes in the ground, and then we manage the backfill operation. So whoever comes to dig it up in the future isn't going to have to deal with that, and they're going to have to, they, they have the, the advantage of, of dealing with that. The other opportunity that you have working on a captured unique system is your ability to innovate in terms of track form. We're not constrained by national standards, heavy rail standards. We aren't required to build a railway out of the same components and have it nationally maintainable. It just needs to be maintainable within itself as a system. So we're able to rationalise the track form. So this is the traditional on-street segregated embedded track form where you have grooved rail in a boot system embedded in concrete and it remains flush with the finished road surface. That's necessary where you're running on street, but it was also specified for where we're running in verges and in um, central reserves. We were able to look at it as a system, 
and develop an alternative solution to that. So anywhere where there was no requirement to actually have integration with vehicular traffic, we were able to design um, unique twin blocks. So this is a bespoke twin block sleeper designed for this system, uh, embedded in a structural track slab. We were then able to look at it as a system rather than as a collection of discrete disciplines, which allowed us to integrate the drainage. We had preformed duct banks, which actually formed the side and the, and the permanent formwork for the actual track slab. The OLE foundations were formed through a thickening of the track slab rather than having to build, certainly in the six foot, rather than having to build discrete local uh, in situ concrete blocks. So that allowed us to be much more efficient in terms of how we built the track. So traditionally, the embedded traditional track takes 70 days per 100 metres of track. We're able to do it half of that, 35 days per 100 metres of track with a significant cost saving, not just associated with the programme. So um, a significant benefit and value for money offering for the whole scheme. Um, we took advantage of off-site manufacturing. All the tram stop units are manufactured off-site. Um, nearly 3,000 units. This allows us to install one platform of a tram stop in five days. So it minimizes the amount of time that you have labor on site, minimizes your exposure to safety risk, and minimizes your impact on the local environment as well, because typically all of these are directly adjacent to either housing estates or uh, very heavily used road, area, uh, road arterial routes. <laughs> Traffic management, running out of time, so I'll just whip through this again. So previously, each individual utility company comes along, puts a TM on, does their work, comes away, we put ours on, and it's very disruptive to the local residents um, and anybody that commutes in and around the, 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 the area. So what we do now is MPT through a subcontract with GTM, we actually manage all the traffic management for everything on, this, on the scheme, whether it's TFGM's operations for the utility diversions or the MPT Sybil's activities. We come in, one programme, one traffic management scheme, finish the work and take it off. Doesn't actually reduce the amount of time that the traffic management is on, but one of the biggest things that we, we, we got from our stakeholder engagement was, is the constant change in traffic management and the changing of the routes is the thing that annoys people the most. If you can leave it on, people get used to how they, the diversions work, they're much more comfortable with leaving it on for the, the year or two years that it's actually in place. Digital work packs. Anybody that actually physically works on site will appreciate that the volume of paperwork that engineers and the supervisors carry around with them is becoming um, extremely prohibitive at the minute. So to try and rationalise that down, we limit the work pack to the pertinent information, but we have these QR codes and, and everybody has a smartphone on site. If they need more detail about the products or the, the processes, they click on the QR code and it can either take them to data sheets or installation example videos uh, and other uh, examples of how to install. So we can minimise the amount of paperwork that is distributed, but still provide the information to the site teams. Wellbeing and mental health, um, big issues in the industry. You know, we had 300 staff and over 1,000 operatives on site um, at peak. So obviously, and 60% of those live within 40 miles of Manchester. So it's a very local um, and large workforce. So we're very minded to ensure that we have systems and processes in place which manages fatigue, uh, manages mental health, manages physical well-being and, and welfare. Expect the unexpected, a bit of a trite phrase, but obviously doing a, a tram scheme where you're breaking ground in a very historic uh, urban area, you don't know what you're going to find until you break ground, and the civil engineers in the room will, will, will echo that. Lots of the routes we find in archaeology. Um, the definition of archaeology has been stretched significantly from what I understand archaeology to be. Um, these are buildings that were built in the 50s, that were demolished in the 70s, and now their basements are archaeological remains. Um, <laughs> Indiana Jones was not interested in any of this, um, and we didn't find any, any treasure. Um, but one of the more significant ones, and it's something that I certainly in 25 years have never seen before, Cross Street Chapel on Cross Street, um, extremely old crypt. There are, there's a vertical graveyard underneath the crypt, and that graveyard actually extended into the tram alignment. And we had forensic archaeologists in there, and we had to exhume, <coughs> catalogue, collect, and then rebury over 1,200 
bodies. Um, extremely sensitive site. Nobody allowed in other than the forensic archaeologists. Um, we were anticipating to find about 200. What we actually found is as we started um, uncovering one layer that families got buried vertically. So as we were excavating down, we'd find another and another and another. Um, so it became quite, a, quite an operation. So that was a very sensitive and fairly unique activity uh, for the job. And then really, Manchester being a fairly vibrant city, uh, throws up its own unique challenges. Um, <coughs> people are extremely happy and vocal and enjoy the social life in Manchester. Christmas markets, the marathon, and we even had naked cyclists uh, rove, rove in the centre. So, 10 years, lots of challenges, lots of unique uh, op civil engineering opportunities. Um, there's still more to come, I'm sure, as we start to uncover what we're doing in, in Trafford. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you.